Welcome to the Contemplating Christian. This is Will Stevie and Samuel Webb, and today we're talking about uh, special revelation from Herman Bobbink's book, The Wonderful Works of God. And as a quote, this kind of sums up a lot of what Bobbink's talking about in these chapters. He says, Christ is the turning point of times. I think it's just an awesome uh, way to see. Uh, Christ is just the middle point of history and the thing upon which, or the person upon which everything else turns in history. So as always, we're going to go through some of the main themes from these chapters. We've got a couple of chapters to go through, all the mm-hmm. chapters covering special revelation. Of course, general revelation is uh, God revealing himself in nature and in the moral law within us. You can think of the, the starry nights in the sky and the moral law within. That's the way to think about general revelation. And then special revelation is, a, is uh, God revealing himself through his word, uh, both the scriptures and his actual divine word, Jesus Christ, his son. That is what special revelation is. And so we're going to look at the interaction between the two of them and uh, specifically special revelation today. So as I was just saying, um, just throughout human history, Herman Bavink makes the point that general revelation is inadequate fully for humanity to find their way to God and to know God. A general revelation has been insufficient, and we've been able to see that all throughout history. We have on there the universality of special revelation. So Bavink talks about that everybody, all these cultures throughout history, have been trying to make more direct connections to God. There's something within that is trying to search out having a more personal connection or relationship to God, which is why we, we see in cultures kind of a universal uh, like priesthood in, in, in different cultures. All cultures have different priests, uh, different you know kind of pagan rituals and stuff to try to connect directly to God or the gods. If anybody knows what a soothsayer is, that's basically just another sort of priestly figure that tries to make a direct connection to the divine, oracles, things like that. That's a pretty universal thing throughout human history. And Bavink makes the point that that is a sign that humanity is trying to reach to God in a very personal way and yet can't. But they know from general revelation that, that you know we're, there's something within us that's trying to get there. Um, also, we have in here, Bavink does not spend his time like debunking all the other world religions and then giving a ton of evidence for Christianity. He just, uh, in a sense, presupposes the truth of Christianity for the sake of this systematic theology. And it's also, uh, he's part of the Reformed tradition, and some of the Reformed tradition emphasizes presuppositional apologetics and a presuppositional approach to theology, which is basically you're assuming the truth of Christianity and then starting from that starting point of Christianity is true. Now let's talk about that more. Uh, Also, there's a special revelation and general revelation kind of work together in a symbiotic way um, where the one clarifies the other. So the more we learn from Christ and his word and scripture, the more we... uh, general revelation gets illumined to us more, and we see more clearly how general revelation reflects God, um, things like that. So without scripture, general revelation would actually be less clear to us. And so they work together um, in a very nice way. That's all I got. All right. So for special revelation, we're going to be talking about the difference in manner, content, and purpose. So Um, we're kind of breaking it into those three categories. So simply the content is what it is and the purpose is the reason uh, for it. And then what we're going to focus on here is the manner, so how it is communicated. All right, so uh, first one is how does God speak to us? We're going to ask that question, and we get a variety of ways. We get uh, revealing, appearing, showing, teaching. We can just attribute so many different verbs to God. Now, What we would say is that speaking is especially important out of all the things he could do. Um, So we see this throughout the entire Bible. Uh, Some examples are like Genesis 1-3, Psalm 33, Psalm 29, Psalm 104, and Isaiah 30 and Isaiah 66. Um, Because it specifically talks about speaking being important. So I'll read a couple of those just to show you. So Psalm 33-6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. So... Is by the word of the Lord, him speaking. And then even in Genesis, uh, first thing we get God doing, he speaks everything into existence. So then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Um, so for some reason, out of all the ways God can reveal himself to us, speech is um, one of the most central or essential themes throughout the scriptures. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's the importance of it. Um, 
for some reason, it just gives us access to God, and even general revelation is seen as speaking sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. So the heavens declare the glory of God or something like that. So it's always something with declaring or speaking or saying. Mm-hmm. All right, and then moving on to this next point, the modern view of religion. So um, Bavink constantly hits home at this idea of pantheism because that's something he's battling. But um, here we see like kind of the death blow to pantheism. So people try and say that, oh, God is nature, but then they also try to connect with God and say God is uh, revealing himself in some way. But there is a problem with that because if God is nature, uh, he can't reveal himself to us. We would just be discovering him and connecting with him. Um, But just the fact that he is speaking or saying or revealing himself to us means that he knows himself perfectly and that he can actually choose to uh, reveal himself. So he's a being, not nature. All right. If it was just nature, we wouldn't see any type of speaking or saying or revealing on his part. It would just be us discovering him. Uh, And that's pretty much it. So uh, we do have a quote from Bavink here. It says, God then does not speak to man nor reveal himself to man. It is man, rather, who reveals God to himself. And that's in pantheism. He's talking about pantheism right there. So it's not God revealing, it's us uh, getting God and then revealing him to ourselves, pretty much. Next, we have this uh, notion of the plowman and the prophet. So you can think of these two things as kind of representative of general revelation and special revelation. The plowman, you can just think of the farmer. Um, But in Isaiah 28, it says how the Lord instructs or teaches the plowman. And we say, how did that happen? Well, it's not through writing. God doesn't teach farmers or the plowman through writing, but it's through his work. So it's through common reason, common sense, the laws of nature, general revelation, what he sees in nature, how plants work, how farming works, these different things. There's clear design in all of that, which reveals God to the plowman. And so that's kind of a good representation of general revelation. Um, And the point we're making is that if general revelation is already God speaking in that way, then there clearly is more to come. We have a God that is constantly revealing himself in all these different ways. So that's uh, kind of the point there. In Psalm 94.9, it says, He that planted the ear shall he not hear. Uh, Bavin kind of makes this point that uh, what Samuel was saying, God knows himself perfectly. And so he has a perfect ability to reveal himself to creatures. So should he not be able to convey himself to creatures, the one who knows himself perfectly and is a speaking God? And so it is just hitting the point further home that our God is a revealing God. And so in general revelation, we have sort of man seeing the things in nature and sort of finding God through that to some degree, but imperfectly. And then special revelation, God really condescends down to man, makes it very clear who he is. Um, And we see many times and in many ways, revelation has come to us. So... Uh, Hebrews 1 obviously says that God has spoken to us in many times and in many ways. We've got things like the direct appearances to Moses and Abraham. We have uh, the glory of God above the tabernacle and in the Holy of Holies. We've got the pillars of cloud and fire. We have God revealing himself through the way of angels or messengers or the angel of the Lord, um, different visions and things like that, Uh, the Urim and the Thummim in the Old Testament. We have the audible voice in different points. Think of the New Testament. We have God speaking like the Father, is speaking, um, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, that's an audible voice, or even at the triumphal entry, there's God speaking, uh, and the people hear something. Um, On the tablets of the law, all these different ways. It's just kind of cool to see a whole uh, array of different ways that God has revealed himself to us in scripture um, and in history. Next, uh, God has specifically uh, one aspect of special revelation that's really clear that we often think about is miracles. This is a way that God has revealed himself to us, the miracles throughout history that have taken place. And Bavink makes this point between the the difference between Old Testament miracles and New Testament miracles. Um, One thing, we had a talk on miracles, actually, and we talked about how there's kind of a misconception about miracles. We underestimate how many miracles are happening today, and we overestimate how many miracles are in the Bible which I think is actually true. So we can't, we often think that in, in Scripture, it's like every page is just chock full of miracles. But if you, like, the time between the patriarchs and Elijah, there's actually not many, like, you know, grand miracles happening all over the place, at least not ones that are written down in Scripture. So obviously God can do whatever he wants all throughout the period, 
and it's not necessarily all written down, but the, there's a pretty clear you know, hundreds of years between patriarchs and Elijah and then like the intertestamental period where God's not like constantly doing a bunch of miracles um, in these kind of grand ways. Um, so the Old Testament miracles, though, have a, a certain function and they kind of relate uh, theologically in, in an important way. Um, they're always a mix of judgment and redemption. So if we think about the Old Testament miracles, think about Noah and the flood. That's always a mix of salvation and judgment on people. Moses and Joshua, same thing. There's always plagues, or the Red Sea. Um, these different miracles always kill some and save others through the miracle. Um, judgment for the enemies of God and a securing of a home for his people was always kind of the theme of the Old Testament miracles. Similarly, with the next chunk of miracles in history centered around Elijah and Elisha, those are two different people, two different prophets, where the worship of the true God was almost entirely suppressed under Ahab and Jezebel, and Jehovah prevails over Baal on Mount Carmel. So this is Bob and quoting here. All the miracles of the Old Testament have the common earmark that negatively they spell judgment for the godless nations, and positively they create and preserve a place among the people, among the people of Israel for the continuing revelation of God. So that's just a really continuous theme in the Old Testament. The miracles are judgment and redemption. And then the New Testament miracles are centered around the person of Jesus Christ uh, and his apostles. And they're of a different nature. They're not really like that. Um, they are, his miracles demonstrate his power over creation. Uh, so he is able to calm the seas. He's able to turn water into wine. He's able to multiply bread. It shows his power over the effects of sin. So he's able to cure diseases, illnesses, calamities, things like that, and his power over sin itself. So he's able to forgive sin, and he's able to exercise demons, etc. But all of these miracles are of a different nature than the Old Testament ones. They are kind of spelling a different message. They're all kind of redemptive in nature. So all of Christ's miracles except one, which is the cursing of the fig tree, actually, which is interesting, are redemptive. Um, the fig tree is the one non-redemptive miracle, and it condemns Israel for the rejection of his prior redemptive work. Uh, and he came into the world to save it. But they rejected it, so he curses the fig tree. Um, yeah. That's yeah? a neat point. All right. <clears throat> We're going to focus on the means a little bit more because we talked about it just a little bit. All right. Um, now, we would break this into two categories. So all the way thus far, uh, we've been <clears throat> focusing on objective and external means that God reveals himself. Now we're going to focus on the subjective and internal means that God reveals himself. And so there is that distinction right there, but under the subjective and internal means, there's another distinction, which is manifestation and inspiration. So we see this in those two ways. For manifestation, we have a couple examples. One would be something like Moses's discourse with God in Exodus. So Moses speaking directly to God as a friend, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that would be God manifesting himself and having a conversation with Moses. Now, that's not something uh, we're going to see, so God will not come to us in a storm cloud, come down and talk to us face to face right now in just like prose discourse or something like that. Um, that's not something exactly we'll see for manifestation. Uh, what people tend to see nowadays for manifestation tends to be more things like dreams and visions, as you see up there. So um, us just getting a dream from God or something about God or uh, him revealing himself to us in some way like that. Uh, now, we wouldn't put it to the level of the prophets or anything like that, but we could say people could get a dream or a vision. Um, and then we actually have a really cool definition of the word vision from Bavink. Then this is how he describes it for God manifesting himself in a vision, which is this. The eye is closed to the external world, and the eye of the soul is opened to divine things. So in a vision, it's, uh, not, it's not that we are unable to see or we become blind or something like that. No, it's just um, we are seeing in a different kind of realm. We could think of it like that. We're seeing the spiritual realm as opposed to the physical realm. Um, but yeah. That's the first one. Next one is inspiration. This is what we get when we think of just holy scriptures. All right, it comes in two ways. First one is written. So the, uh, the prophets, the writers of the law books, the writers of the gospels, and uh, Paul with his letters and everything like that, all the writers of 
the Bible. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they wrote down the Word of God. All right? So that's one way um, God inspires through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. All right? The second one is internal illumination. This one applies to us, because obviously we aren't going to be inspired by the Holy Spirit and write down Scripture, um, because Scripture is complete at this time. Nothing is going to be added. Uh, so we have internal illumination. So when we're reading the scriptures, we will be enlightened, we will be illumined uh, to the truth of God's word. So when we're reading it and understand something and we, uh, it finally makes sense to us, we can say that the Holy Spirit is working in us and God is revealing himself to us, especially through internal, internal illumination. So our mind uh, is uh, illumined. We have light in the darkness to something we did not know before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what we would, uh, that's what we would say. And we see uh, special revelation kind of take a new course with Abraham. So the special revelation Abraham kind of um, sets the course for the rest of Scripture and how God is revealing Himself. Um, and it is God's self-revelation to this one man who ends up becoming a people and a nation, and through him, all the nations either of the earth are blessed. So one man to one people, to the whole world, which is very, very interesting how God decides to do that. And, and it highlights the personal aspect of God. It highlights the personal nature of our faith. This revelation to Abraham is the foundation of Christianity. The substance and blessing of this Abrahamic faith has always been the personal relationship of the sinner to his saving God. Romans 4, Paul describes Abraham and David as blessed men because they had received forgiveness of their sins through their faith in God. Circumcision for Abraham was a sign and seal of the faith that Abraham had. Consequently, the forgiveness of sins, and so the whole of salvation, is, is independent of the law and of its demands. It was simply uh, his belief in God, and same thing with David. There was no sacrifice he could have performed to forgive his sins, it says, after uh, the murder of Uriah and Bathsheba, and the, the adultery with Bathsheba. It says that there's nothing he could do to perform anything to atone for his own sins. He just had to believe God. Um, so this simple religion of faith and forgiveness was established and promised to be delivered to the whole world, the sort of uh, personal forgiveness with your God, with God. And God initiates all of this. So he initiates and promises, and then we respond with faith. But this is the unique aspect of the Christian God, is that he initiates. He calls Abraham and leads him to Canaan. He promises to be his God, promises a miraculous child, Isaac, promises that he will be a father to many, promises Canaan as his inheritance. He promises that his posterity will be a blessing to all the nations. Our religion has always been about what God has done for us. The core of special revelation is this personal self-revelation of God to us and our walk and response by faith. So a promise cannot become ours except by faith, and faith expresses itself in righteous conduct after that. And so kind of this neat idea is that just like Isaac came about supernaturally and from him a whole nation, we Christians are spiritually born again uh, supernaturally and formed into a holy nation. And now we're children of Abraham by faith, uh, spiritual children of Abraham, not physical descendants, obviously. Mm -hmm. So this special revelation to Abraham kind of sets the tone for the rest of scripture. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, we have the law now. So we're getting into the law, and we're going to ask the question, why the law? Okay, so first one is meaning of the law. So it followed the promise, and it was temporary and transient. That's what it means, okay? So, well, that's one part of what it means, actually. So we would say that the law is not the main thing. The promise is the main thing, okay? Uh, and people have misunderstood the law in that sense. A lot of people uh, think that the law came first. Well, no, it was the promise first and then the law after. And that's how we know that it is also temporary and transient because it will pass away. And Jesus said, um, well, Jesus fulfilled it. And then he said that it will, he basically left us to deduce that it would eventually be gone. There is going to be a time when it's done away with, right? Um, in the future, not right now. But that's one thing we would say. But the promise has always remained and will always remain until he actually fulfills it. So the law actually um, helped fulfill the promise, we would say. Okay? Now, uh, 
Next is that it was not directly given and not to all people. Okay, that's one thing about the law, uh, which is also how we know that it is not primary. It was only given to Moses. The promise was given to everyone. Um, and it was directly given for all people. We also know that the law isn't as important because there's no mediator for the law, but there's a mediator for the promise, as in Jesus is our mediator for the promise that God gave us, but it's not like we have a mediator for um, every single law or something like that. Okay, then we would also say that the law is holy and righteous uh, under the meaning of, of the law. All right, so the law did not annul the promise because it's of a different kind. So a lot of people think that the law got rid of the promise or uh, it's like done away with now. Uh, but the reason is, it, well, the reason why both of them are still there is because they're of a different kind. They don't annul each other. They don't contradict each other. They can work together because they are two different things. All right. And that's what we would say uh, about that. But it is a good thing. The law is holy and righteous. It's not a bad thing. All right, then we go to the purpose of the law, uh, which is getting, so at the beginning of this talk, we said we were going to go over the means, the meaning, and the purpose. Or when I say meaning, it could be content as well. So now we're at the final one of those three, which is the purpose. And there's a twofold purpose. All right, <clears throat> so it made our transgressions more severe. So it brought stuff to issues of life and death. All right, sin takes on a new character, and we now get this idea of breaking a promise with God. So we have this promise, the law guides us, and now we can start to betray that. We can uh, betray that with God, and it just brought it to a, a level of life and death, because when we do break the law, we can get punished in that way. All right, and then it makes clear the necessity of the promise because the law brings death. That's the other thing. So we know that the law isn't the main thing because what ends, it, well, what comes from it is death, whereas the promise brings life. But the law, even though it guides people and helps people, it shows us the necessity and highlights it because we are meant to have life and not death. Hmm. All right. Um, and the last thing, really quick, is this. <clears throat> the law became Israel's teacher. Okay, it's what caused them to cling to the promises of God. Okay, uh, so here's a quote we actually have from Bavink. It's, but now the law has fenced Israel in, segregated her, maintained her in isolation, guarded her against dissolution, and has thus created an area and defined a sphere in which God could preserve his promise purely, give it wider scope, develop it, increase it, and bring it always closer to fulfillment. All right, so God used the law to bring about more of the promise. And that's how it worked. All right, continuing with the law. So what we've kind of, well, what I've been kind of hitting at is promise is primary, law is subordinate, okay? So law is under the promise because the promise came first. So the promise is the goal, the law is the means. Uh, the content of the law agrees with God's purpose. Again, they aren't contradictory. Um, and Israel, at this point, had to live a new life uh, with this new purpose, okay? And what we'd say about this is that the exodus, or when we received the law and uh, had that salvation story from Egypt, is that that's the foundation of Israel's history and religion, all right? It's what's constantly referred back to in the Bible. If you go to the New Testament, if you go to um, <clears throat> the prophets or anything like that, there are constant references all the way back to the Exodus. There is something special about the book of Exodus. I mean, just look at, uh, look at the book of Hebrews. If you read the letter of Hebrews, there are just constant references of, hey, don't fall back into that. Don't be like the Israelites in the wilderness. Don't do this, right? And it's just referring back to this story of the Exodus when we get the law, and God is really accelerating, fulfilling his promise there. So that's the foundation of it. Um, it prefigures the salvation Christ brings us from slavery to, uh, under sin uh, to freedom. Mm -hmm. All right, now we get this third point right here, which is the characteristics of the law. We do see the law having certain characteristics, okay? So when it was given at Mount Sinai, there was a new order to further develop fulfilling the promise. Um, and here are the qualities. First one is the law is religious. So it's just based on God. 
as in when you read the Ten Commandments in Exodus, you'll see that at the beginning, before any commands, it says that it's given to us by God. God said these things, okay? So it's religious. You can't have that type of law without God. Next one is the law is moral, so it's just on moral principles in the spirit of love. So it's how to love God correctly and how to love others correctly. It's all about that and how to live uh, a moral and loving life uh, internally and externally. Mm -hmm. Then we would say the law is holy, as in God is gracious but also brings judgment. When we see the law, there are obviously consequences to breaking the law, which reveals God's holiness, as in he can't be in the presence of sin, and also he's a good judge. He cannot just turn a blind eye and let that go. Now, the last one on that is the law is that of liberty, as is it's freeing. So God does not impose himself upon us, uh, and this law, it assumes and acknowledges rights and relations. So we, uh, we are free to live in accordance with God's law and in right relation with God. And for some reason, a lot of this is focused on family and right orientation with the family and rights and relations with family. All right. And I, I just think one of the best examples we have of this uh, glorifying and freedom and happiness in the law is just Psalm 119. Constantly saying, like, he finds joy and happiness and ble uh, blessings in God's law, that it's not a bad thing, that it's a good thing. And he loves, uh, you know, meditating it and he wants God to help him follow it because it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. All right. And Psalm 119 is just great for that. Lastly, we got just a couple quick more things on the law of God. There's like a million pages on this in the, <laughs> in the chapters. But um, the law of God reforms kingship in the ancient world. So beforehand, uh, the other nations around Israel, for you to be the king basically means you, you, the buck stops with you. You are the highest authority. But with the Israelites, it was not that way. So even if you were King David, you were still submitting to something higher than yourself. So kingship is kind of reformed with the law of God. So the king submits to something higher than himself, which is God, through his law. The king himself is submissive to the law of God. He's not just making stuff up himself, uh, which is, a, in, in the ancient world, an improvement. And some of Israel's kings followed that. Many of them did not. Much more of them did not follow that uh, way. But God was still king even when Israel had uh, a king. Uh, there was a higher king. And also there was these matters of temporal judgment and punishments were given uh, to the uh, leaders of Israel so that they could kind of freely discern uh, different cases and different um, matters of dispute. They could, they had freedom to kind of give different punishments and things like that. Um, and internal and external conduct. So the law was supposed to be, uh, there's this kind of the ceremonial aspects of it. Those are like your external religious actions. And there's the moral law. And they're not supposed to be opposed to each other. So Israel was supposed to be holy, both internally and externally, by following the law. But we see throughout scripture that what constantly happened was that they would repeat the religious actions, but would not have proper faith or a proper heart behind it, which is why we see God saying things like, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Or David in Psalm 51 saying, um, if there was a sacrifice I could give, I would give it, but your, your delight is not in burnt offerings, it's in a contrite heart. So we see that the law was for that purpose, but uh, Israel failed in that regard many times. And then uh, from the law, we have like all the history books that come after it that kind of complete the Old Testament. <coughs> and Bavink makes this point that um, these history books are basically the record of God's covenant relationship with his people and how they constantly fail him, and basically God's writing about it. So he calls the historical books the diary book of Jehovah, which is very interesting. And um, basically, it's just this constant uh, daily relationship of how are they doing? They're failing. And that's kind of a theme of all of the historical books. If you think of like the book of Judges, this constant cycle downwards of failing God and not being able to uphold the law, which makes um, it all of this serves the, the purpose of the promises of God and the grace of God being all the greater later on as we look forward to the promised king who will change our hearts so that we can actually obey the law. <clears throat> and all this leads to a convergence on Christ. All the law, the prophets, all the special revelation, manifestation, and inspiration, all of it leads to the person of Jesus Christ. And even the New Testament, which happens after the fact of Jesus Christ, points back to him. All right? 
Um, so here's what we'd say for this first point. Um, after all that, those stories and prophets and stuff, we have a time of scriptural scholasticism right before Jesus. So the letter of the law. Okay, there was a hyper focus on the letter and forgot the spirit of it. Now, that obviously was a bad thing, and that's what Jesus opposed eventually. But we would actually say, and this is what Boving says, that idolatry was actually deflected for a little bit. And when I say idolatry, I'm talking about like the idolatry of the Old Testament. Obviously, not the idolatry in our hearts that obviously still continued, but we're talking about actual making of idols and worshiping them and all of that stuff. That was deflected because there was this really, really intense sect of Judaism. All right? And they kind of stopped it. So God, uh, God kind of blessed them with that deflection right there. But also something bad came about that. So at that point, they became servants in their own land and started fulfilling those prophecies uh, because that is talked about. So Israel would become a servant of, of their own land under the empire of Rome, specifically. Um, yeah, and then also during this time, we see heroes and heroines. And Bavink specifically points out the saints, and then even more specifically points out Mother Mary. All right, now, he would not hold to the dogma of the Catholic Church, but he would say, and I think even rightly, we could say that Mary did play a special role in just being the mother of Jesus. Mm-hmm. All right, as in there is, is actually something special about that. So we have these uh, heroes and heroines that pop up and show us how to submit courageously to the will of God in childlike faith and hope in this convergence of Christ. Mm-hmm. All right, now, for the convergence, we see these phrases of promise and fulfillment or shadow and body, image and reality, and so on and so forth. And so what we would say is Jesus is the fulfillment of all prior revelation. So again, if you go to the book of Hebrews, which has been referenced multiple times in this talk, uh, you'll see the word, uh, well, the, the phrases and the description that all the Old Testament sacrifices were just a shadow of the things to come. All right? So that's what we're talking about, this convergence. Jesus Christ is the real thing. Everything is coming together. The, the promise and the law and all those things come together on Jesus Christ and make sense of it all. Mm-hmm. All right? Yeah, and then just to finish this point with Bobbing's last kind of paragraph here, he says, Whereas in the Old Testament everything led up to Christ, in the New Testament everything is derived from him. Christ is the turning point of times. The promise made to Abraham now comes to all nations. The Jerusalem which was below gives way to the Jerusalem which is above and is the mother of us all. Mm -hmm. Israel is supplanted by the church out of all tongues and peoples. This is the dispensation of the fullness of times, in which the middle wall of partition is broken down, in which Jew and Gentile is made a new man, and in which all is gathered together under one head, namely, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we would also say for this last point on this slide is, revelation can no longer be increased. All right? Uh, So special revelation, we've had all these different types and kinds and uh, contents and stuff like that, but in Jesus Christ, we can't have any more. Like, there's nothing better than Jesus Christ. You can't get uh, more illuminated or more inspired than what happened with Jesus Christ. Um, Yeah, so that's why, again, that's why the book of Hebrews constantly warns and says, don't go back to the old ways because Jesus Christ is the most we're going to get. All right, you can't get more than that. You can't get something better. Yeah. I agree. Some application from this talk. Uh, I think that this should give uh, some just some confidence in just the whole cohesiveness of Scripture and just the full force of both general and special revelation should give us just confidence in our walks, in our faith, um, and just seeing the beauty of all that God has done and revealed to us. We can learn from the Old Testament in a ton of ways, but one particular is that we, um, how quickly Israel falls away from things, uh, falls away from God, and knowing that that is the same nature that we share. And so we must you know, pray that God preserves us in the faith and stay dependent on him because we know that we are weak if we walk in the flesh. We should also rejoice in the law. We should have the heart posture of Psalm 119 of rejoicing in God's law, having it be our delight, uh, knowing that because of the Holy Spirit we, have given, we are given the power to obey the law now. Um, 
We won't be perfect, but we now have a new power to actually walk in obedience to God's law. And we should just appreciate that God is a revealing God, that he reveals himself to us in all of these different ways. As we've looked at over the last few talks, um, God is a speaking God, a revealing God, a, a God that gives himself to us ultimately in his son, and so we should praise him for that. And that's some application. Yeah. All right, we're just going to pray out really quick, and then we're all done. All right, dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for today, uh, and just thank you for your word and your special revelation to us. I uh, just want to lift that up and glorify it, and uh, thank you for it. So I ask that uh, in these coming days, you allow us to appreciate uh, all that you've done and all the uh, revealing you have done as well, all that you've given to us and revealed about yourself. And I ask that you illuminate us internally uh, and let us understand all of this special revelation. And I ask that you let it highlight general revelation in your, your creation and uh, everything like that. And ultimately, just let everything point back to us uh, loving you more and glorifying you more and uh, just focusing on you more because you want a relationship, you are a personal being and want to reveal yourself to us mm -hmm. to be in a right relationship. So, yeah, we thank you and love you. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.